Hello, this is your host, Cheryl C. Jones, with a warning. This podcast contains true stories of individual genius that may inspire you to take action in your own life. Listener discretion is advised. Okay, welcome back, Matthew, for part two of our ongoing conversation, which has been just fascinating. I have, still have a dozen questions. All right, maybe not quite a dozen, but more things I want to talk about. In our, in our last episode, we were talking about the way to be successful is to have a system and to use stories. And I literally have been taking notes. So, um, you know, because there's so much good stuff here, rich stuff that I want to figure out how to apply. And I know there's lots of ways that I, I can make that happen. Um, we were, we kind of dropped off with, with the idea of, uh, with you suggesting that we download the, from your website, the Introvert's Edge, the first chapter, and reviewing that and figuring out where our stories and our information fits within that framework. And, um, and I had a question earlier and I've forgotten what it was. But what do you, what would you want to talk about? <laughs> Let's go there. <laughs> well, what do we talk about? Because I, I know a lot of I know a lot of people that you speak to or help. Uh, a lot of them run their own businesses. And the there are two major issues when you're trying to run a business and you're trying to succeed. And you know, everybody listening, I've got no doubt that you're good at your, or great at your functional skill. I think that is something that we should just take as obvious. The problem is how do you get people to pay you what you're worth? How do you, I mean, really, I, I feel like most business owners are stuck in this constant hamster wheel of struggling to find interested prospects, setting themselves apart and making the sale while also constantly feeling like the person's only making a decision purely based on price. So right. absolutely. I, why don't we spend today's session talking about, okay, it's great when you get a customer to sell to. And as you know, as I said in the, the end of the last chapter, uh, so the last session, you don't need to buy my book. You can go to the introvertsedge.com, download the seven step process. And literally, if you just look at what you currently say and put what you say into those categories, fill in the gaps, you'll double your sales process. But there's a lot of heavy lifting that you can do in the sales uh, before you even get to sales that actually means that people are actually intrigued and interested in what you do. And more specifically, you know, see you as the only logical choice, which means that price becomes much less of a factor. So um, I'm assuming when you say help them see you as the only logical choice, part of that is in through the storytelling, because we will, as I'm going to play it out here, but as we uh, talk about the stories that we've been involved in, we've been a key player. So because they're going to be success stories, right, um, with our clients and so forth. Um, what... Mm. how would you frame the uniqueness of your individual gifts that you bring, because each of us has those, bring to that client? How do you frame them without saying I all the time? I did this. I am so wonderful. So when, you, worker. <laughs> so when you talk about, when you talk about storytelling, the problem with story, the, the good thing and the problem with story is, can you imagine walking up to someone in a networking room? and saying, I've got a great story to tell you. They'll be like, oh my gosh, right? I, I, don't, I don't have time for that, right? So what you need is a hook that really attracts people. Now, I mean, marketers have been using hooks for, for, for years. I mean, every time you see an ad that catches your attention on Facebook, every time you see a billboard that's got like this weird question that engages you and shock, sometimes even shocks you, mm -hmm. that's a hook. When you go networking, you need a hook to engage and interest people so that you get the opportunity to deliver your story. But also, you need it to decommoditize yourself. I mean, you think about it, when you go to a networking event, I mean, if you say, I'm, I'm an accountant, I'm a lawyer, I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a, you know, I'm a ghostwriter, I'm a business coach, mm -hmm. people will say a couple of things. They'll say, oh, I had a sales trainer before, it didn't really work out for me, and you know, I, he was kind of a bit of a scam artist. Now they're looking at you like you're almost a bit of a scam artist. Right. That does not go well. And that puts you straight in the defensive. Oh, no, I'm different. You know, I've got unique skills. I have magic ruby slippers. Like it's this thing that you end up on this defensive. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say, oh, I need, I, need a, I need a lawyer. How much do you charge per hour? Mm -hmm. Now you're in this 
you know, type of cost. Oh, oh, I need a trademark. How much do you charge for trademarks? And, you know, as soon as now we're in a conversation about price, and if you've read my first book on sales, you can't talk about price yet. You don't understand their direct needs. You haven't instilled right. good value. You haven't told one of your amazing stories, which you can hear about in the, the first episode we did together. So if you're at that point and you're talking about price, you're going to lose because you're either going to avoid the price question, in which case they're going to get frustrated with you. And if you answer and you're not the cheapest, then unless you've got a great story, which you should, which will life likely help you, but still they already see you as a commodity. So because of that, what we need to do is learn to sidestep the, bat the battle altogether. Now, the way I suggest people do that is with two other steps. One is creating a, a hook or what I call a unified message. And the second is to niche down so that they are only seen as a logical choice for that group, which we, we discussed in the last episode, how that limits the number of stories you need. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example of that actually was I worked with this client out of California, uh, Wendy, she was a language coach and she taught kids and adults Mandarin. And, you know, she was a great coach. I mean, she, for a decade or so, she'd been charging 50 to $80 an hour for private consultation. And then all of a sudden, I mean, the world got more competitive, didn't it? I mean, there were people moving into California charging $30 to $40 an hour. There were uh, now people on Craigslist from China willing to charge $12 an hour. And I mean, there's even technology now. I'll teach you Mandarin, you teach me English, we won't charge anyone anything. So now she's competing against free. So she comes to me and she's like, Matt, how can you know, teach me some sales techniques to close more deals? Now, sure, stories would help because it fosters rapport and relationship. You know, it you know, allows people to have that shared experience. And, you know, people will see them through those stories as being able to deliver a result. But eventually, they're going to realize they can get it for free or for $12 an hour from somebody that's really in China, right? So the sales process would have got them her great results, but not as great as sidestepping the battle. So we went looking for how we could transition her into her own marketplace. And now, the reason why I say that is everyone has unique skills, upbringings, talents that perfectly qualify them to help a group of people. And there's no way signified. I mean, you look at mine, I've been responsible for five multi-million dollar businesses. I know marketing, I know sales, I know the you know, thought psychology. I know so many things and truthfully, nobody cares, <laughs> right? Nobody does, right? Nobody cares. Everybody that's listening, you all have likely had amazing life experiences yourselves and still nobody cares, at least not enough to really listen in a networking conversation to hear it all, right? Ever had somebody say, when you say, what is it you do? Say, oh, it's complicated oh my gosh, run away, right? So the focal point is that because of that, we try to define ourselves by this functional skill, but now we're in this box, which is like going to the, the, the grocery store, looking at milk and saying, give me one reason why I should pay for the more expensive one. Okay, if we've got dietary requirements, fine, but milk's milk, right? Even to these days, TVs are TVs really. And that's you know a more complex topic, product, right? So for us, what we need to do is sidestep the battle right? Become a different version of technology. So if you like, so what I said to Wendy is, you know, give me a look at some of the customers you've worked with. And I mean, she'd worked with hundreds over the years, but I discovered these two people specifically that she helped with more than just language tuition. I mean, she, there were executives being relocated from across to China. And I mean, she helped them understand the, the difference between relationship there. Like, you know, you can't sell on day one. Like here, we try and sell within a 45 minute conversation, like by asking something terrible, like, do you want to move forward if you're a bad salesperson? And then if somebody, you know, everyone says, let me think about it, Pat. And then a week later, you know, they're still thinking about it. We know our chances of getting that sale are falling apart. In China, they're going to want to see you, you know, maybe five or six times before they discuss business. They're probably going to want to see you drunk over karaoke once or twice. I mean, it's just the type of people that they are. Now, so she helped them understand that because, I mean, they're talking about 50 to 100 year deals, not transactional 12 month contracts. Now, she helped them understand that. She helped them understand the difference between e-commerce in China and e-commerce in the Western world. And then a lot of cultural norms, like how to handle a business card, why it's important to reduce your accent. I stopped her and I said, well, you do so much more for these people than just private language tuition. What are you doing? She's like, well, I'm just trying to help. And I'm like, yes, but you're stuck in your functional skill. And this is what everybody does. Right? They get stuck in this thing that they do, right? especially highly qualified groups like accountants, lawyers, doctors. I mean, they're always stuck in this thing because why shouldn't they call themselves that? Everybody wants to be one, right? So why wouldn't they want to use that name? Because there's a lot of other people with that same name willing to charge less. So you can't. So because of that, I said, why don't we call you, right? 
why don't we, this is a lot of success that you create. Is it fair to assume that these people will be more successful in China? And she's like, well, yeah, I mean, obviously that's the point, right? So great, let's call you the China success coach then. I said, forget about Mandarin, that's an afterthought. Let's create what I call the China success intensive that focused on these skills to help executives be successful when they get there. Now, the first part of this is what I call the unified message, right? What is the China success coach? That's the point. If you meet someone and say, what exactly do you do? Um, and they say, oh, I'm the China success coach. The only thing that can possibly come out of your mouth is what exactly is that? And that's the point. You've now hooked them into explaining your passion, your mission, and your stories, right? Because they asked, not because you're shoving something down their throat that they didn't ask for. So she loved the idea of this. I then said, she's like, well, who do I sell it to? Now, obviously, we're kind of in that situation at this point where we've kind of already kind of picked the niche, right? Executives being relocated to China. So she's like, well, I said, well, who do you think you should sell it to? And she's like, well, obviously the executive. And I said, yeah, I mean, the executives are terrified moving to China. I mean, I was terrified moving from Australia to the US and you guys kind of speak the same language. So because of that, I, you know, I, I understood what she was getting at. I'm like, it's not your ideal customer though. And she's like, obviously the organization would pay. I'm like, yeah, I mean, the organization a lot of times has millions, if not billions of dollars riding on these big executives going to China. Still not your ideal client, though. Frustrated, she's like, well, who then? And I'm like, your ideal client's the immigration attorney. She's like, what? And I'm like, well, think about it. I mean, these people charge five to $7,000 for doing all the bureaucracy and paperwork that comes with getting a visa. It doesn't include getting all the clients. That costs money, too. They'd be lucky to make $3,000 for a successful visa application. I said, so offer them $3,000 for a successful introduction. How granular is that niche? We're only looking for immigration attorneys that want to earn additional revenue that work with executives being relocated to China. Awesome. No competition. Yeah. So she started approaching them. They love the idea. She's like, well, who do I, you know, what, what do we need to say? It's easy. All you've got to do is say, congratulations, you've now got your visa. I just want to double check you're as ready as possible to be, you know, to, 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 to head over. And they'd say, yeah, I think we're set. You know, we've got our visa now. Thank you. Place is sorted. Um, you know, we've got a house when we get there. And the kids are, you know, and us are getting pretty good at the language. So I, I think we're set. And they just respond with, there's a lot more to it than that. I think you need to speak to the China success coach. When do you then get on the phone with the easiest customer in the world? I mean, these people were terrified to go. The organization was motivated to pay. And they were recommended by their attorney, which is why she got away with charging $30,000 for this. Minus a $3,000 commission to the agent, she made $27,000 for the easiest sale in the world instead of hustling every day if I only gave her sales training mm -hmm. to you know, get you know, $50, $80 an hour work. Right. That's rapid growth. That's the power of having a unified message that separates you, a great package, which is what I call the Trojan horse package, if you like, and then a solid niche of clients where you're the only logical choice. At that point, it doesn't really matter what you charge. Mm -hmm. And when you go to a networking event, you don't say, oh, you know, I, I teach language and I, I kind of help executives be successful when they go to China. You proudly say, I'm the China success coach. When I go out into the world, you know, I, anything else would not work, right? Because I wouldn't get heard in the crowded marketplace. And regardless of how much experience, remember, nobody cares. Right. So instead, I call myself the rapid growth guy. And that gets me heard in the crowded marketplace. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and I, I like it because it's um, it, just like the China success coach, it causes you to want to know more. And, you know, rapid growth guy, totally, you know. Um, and you carry that off really, really well <laughs> because you are that, you know. Well, what's, what's funny is the first time I told it to somebody, like this is the problem. Most people will come up with a message and then they'll go and ask their friends and family. That's like saying, Cheryl, I know we've known each other for a long time and I know you know me as Matt but if you could start calling me Tom from now on, I'd really appreciate it, right? You'd be like, what? Now, so if you're an accountant or a doctor or a lawyer or you know, a ghostwriter or whatever, you can't go to the people that know you as Matt and start asking them to call you Tom, right? They're going to think that's weird, mm -hmm. right? But as a hook to attract new clients, absolutely. I made that mistake. I went and you know, spoke to a person that knew me as a great sales trainer and it was a you know, close colleague of mine. And I said, I'm thinking about calling myself the rapid growth guy. And he made it very clear that I sounded like a performance, a performance drug that you use in, in the bedroom. Right. So, and I was like, okay, well that sucks. And it really hit me for six. And, but now, I mean, I've had to trademark it because everybody tries to be the rapid growth guy. 
right? Yeah. So we use it. We've got people with, that are asking to be certified in my methodology because they want to call themselves rapid growth mentors. It's, it's become an identity. What you've got to understand is becoming different is scary, mm. but it also is what gets you paid. No one got paid the big dollars by saying, I'm actually exactly the same as everyone else. And no one got paid the big dollars by being different to everyone else, but not being able to articulate it in a way that others could understand and be given the opportunity. Some people have amazing relationships that give them advantages over the people that don't. However, when I moved to the US, I mean, I didn't know anybody. A year later, I was invited to events as one of the most connected people in Austin. That came from being the rapid growth guy, not the sales trainer, because in truth, most people don't want to invite a sales trainer to a party because they'll sell them something. Good point. Very good point. So um, one of the, the we're kind of we're kind of getting got a few more minutes, but I wanted to ask you about we spoke something earlier of something earlier about um, getting paid what you're worth. And Wendy went from that, you know, fifty dollars an hour to you know thirty thousand dollar package, and 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 I don't know enough anything about Wendy's background or what her package and offers and if it's a training and those kinds of things. Um, the challenge is if we're most people said I think set their prices based on what they think the market will bear or what their colleagues set their fees at. So when any suggestions or ideas around the idea of really being clear on what your worth is and what you bring, and I feel like it ties back to something in the first segment that we talked about when you talked about the um, real cost, opportunity costs, and emotional costs. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on that, because I think most people still think, oh, well, I'm a $30 an hour, or I'm $125 an hour, or, you know, so Absolutely. forth. Absolutely. Well, I mean, the first thing everyone needs to understand is that they've got to stop charging by the hourly, hourly amount. I mean, firstly, if you run your own business, you probably already have realized that you get to spend very little time actually doing the work that you're employed to do, which means you have to charge at least three times as much as what you would have as an employee. Right. So that's your first hurdle. Or just get used to a very, very painful life, right? <laughs> yes. Now, a good example of this actually is, is Whitney. Um, Whitney came to me and she was a copywriter. And... So she had about four subscriptions where they were paying her about two and a half thousand dollars a month. And she actually was in that situation where two clients in 60 days canceled with her. Ooh. And so she was like, okay, now my income's halved. So she reached out to me again for sales training and advice. And she said she was now part of this globally competitive world. Same issue, right? Now we agreed to work together, but literally it was like, I think, eight weeks, nine weeks before I could fit her in. Um, and she lost another client in the meantime. Oh. So she's down to two and a half thousand, like less than what she was getting paid for, you know, what she was paying her caregiver. So she's now in this situation. She comes to me, she's like, well, how do I charge for I mean, copywriting services? People always ask how much for a blog post, how much for this? And she was in that transactional world. No one would be willing to commit. No one was willing anymore to commit to like a monthly subscription. So she's like, well, how do I price for the blog post or this or that? And I'm like, you're thinking the wrong way. You've got to stop selling on workload hours and what you do and start charging on the outcomes that you provide, period, right? I, I have a rapid growth intensive. I have a rapid growth academy, right? I even have a whole bunch of free content that I offer to people, right, to allow them to create rapid growth. I sell an outcome, not a product, right? Regardless of which delivery method. Now, when somebody like Whitney came to me, I said, the first thing, you know, we, we came up with, I mean, she was a mate. She did her niche. She didn't know this at the time, but it was healthcare workers. I mean, she had a heart condition and, you know, she would have died if, if not for health tech companies, you know, creating stuff. She had a real passion for that, which is important. She didn't realize but when I brought it up, she's like, oh my God, I can't believe that I didn't see that myself. She was a marketer, right? So the first thing is we went with that. And then the second thing is we, we then called her the mission maven, which got her the opportunity to speak to people, right? Because health tech companies, mission maven. But I said, well, what are the three major problems that a niche has or that niche has? And she's like, well, firstly, you know, they they don't know who their avatar is, right? They, they end up talking to the wrong person. Um, so, you know, they need to know who it is so they can actually write to those people's needs because more often than not, they write about the funding they just got to impress their golf buddies or they write about, you know, the, um, the features of their product in a white paper, but they don't attach it to the person because they don't understand them well enough. So we need them to help them really understand who they're speaking to. 
Secondly, you know, I need to audit all their content because a lot of it's written to their golf buddies. So I need to help them get rid of that and then create a, a list of content that they do need to create. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I want to help them. I mean, content's useless if people don't see it, right? So I need to help them get it in front of their distribution, right? The, the right people. And, you know, obviously I'll then write all the content. I said, okay, so what I'm hearing is that if we forget out the content, where I know that that's important that you want to do that. That's your, you know, your bread and butter, but bear with me for a second. If we just talk about helping them find their avatar, auditing their content, creating what I call the content tree, you have all the content they need to create and create a distribution plan, you could come off as an external consultant that has no interest in doing copyright. And my belief is if you do that, you'll get into more doors, firstly as the mission maven, but then as the mission maven external contractor to figure out what they're doing and why it's not working or because they're considering doing it, but they want to do it the right way. Because every CEO of a company or head of marketing would much prefer to have somebody else to blame than themselves for the decision that was made. So it's an easy decision, right? Especially if it's not working, they might be able to save the day and I can take credit for it, right? So the focal point is go in that way. This is what I call as a Trojan horse package. The idea is to get in the door, right? So she went out and literally she would call herself the mission maven. She'd reach out to people as an external contractor and she charged three and a half thousand dollars for a series of three sessions, really, to go and do that auditing to give them, you know, a report. And at the end of that, she would give them a scope of work document that highlighted what they should be doing, their avatar, all those sorts of things, and then a a, a, a request for an RFP, a request for pricing, um, to say this is who you should hire to do it. This is the contractor or a person you should employ. And she got her first client, this was all planned, she got her first client within 45 days. At the end of doing that, explaining the SOP and, you know, explaining the scope of work document, sorry, sorry, the scope of work document and the RFP, the guy interrupts and goes, can't you just do it? And she's, and the script that we created for her is, yes, I mean, well, sorry, well, sorry, well, we really appreciate the offer. We actually do our best not to work with individual clients because we like to come across as that unbiased source but we really enjoyed working with you. And we do have an exclusive group of VIP clients only so we can stay at the top of our game. And we do have space for one more person. So we'd love to invite you to be part of that, but that would be $10,000 a month. And the client just went, sure. So now she's replaced all of her client, lost clients with one deal. Amazing. Then she went out and she did the same thing again. The next person didn't interrupt her, but at the end she said, now we don't normally do this, but we loved working with you so much. We'd like to throw our hat in the ring. And she, anyway, same similar script, $10,000 a month. The client said, sure. Within less than six months, she had four clients like that paying her $40,000 a month. Wow. Now she got the, the attention of a big digital agency who could not get clients like she could get clients. I mean, health tech companies are impossible to access. Mm-hmm. So he bought her company. Now she's oh. the mission maven inside a bigger organization. She has her own mission mavens that are a team and she still works from home, but everybody else works really hard. She's got a great lifestyle, right? So that's the power of really thinking through the way you charge. Now, if she had have said, this is how much I charge per hour, that wouldn't have happened. She came in as an external, she sold the outcome of feeling control of your copywriting and three and a half thousand dollars wasn't a lot of money, but it was a lost leader for her really to get the copywriting work. Mm -hmm. But it was her willingness not to try and sell that. Everyone wants to sell all the 20 things they want to do for someone in the one meeting. But the easiest person to sell to is someone that's already experienced your value. So I said, sell this first, get them to experience the value of who you are and your depth of knowledge, and then they won't question it. I mean, for, you know, for an attorney, they always think that it's so important that they get their hourly rate. No, sell an outcome. And then the next thing, feel free to charge per hour. But now they don't care really because they're a pre-existing customer. Mm-hmm. I think my account put prices up on me maybe five times in the last two, 12 months. I don't care. I, just, I don't have time to relook for a new accountant. And she's doing a great job. Why would I care? Exactly. Right? I'm buying the outcome of not having to worry about it. But if I saw her, which I did at the initial stage, as just an accountant, of course, I compared her against all the other prices and their experience. Now, I was willing, because I, 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 I put a price on premium advice, to pay a premium for that advice. Most people in today's day and age are not willing to pay a premium for advice, but they are willing to pay a premium for outcomes. Absolutely. I think you're right. And, and that relationship piece is real important. You've built a trust with your accountant and you depend on that person to give you, you know, 
the right, the real deal and, and tell you what's, what's what, and you know, you know them. So there's a lot of value that you've placed in that relationship too, I think, which is what Whitney created in her experience was, yeah. Um, it's all got to be based on outcomes. And if you, I mean, if you say doing this work will cost me 50 hours and that will cost you $10,000, you're like, you get out your calculator and you're like, that's a lot to pay per hour. However, if you say, I can get you this outcome for $10,000, they'll like, oh, sounds good. Exactly. Yes, exactly. I, you know, I think that's, that's really the most important advice you've, well, there's been a lot of really great advice you've given us, but one of the most important things to think about in terms of how we think about our own services and, and how we provide them. You think about outcome over dollarly, a dollar per hour rate. Definitely important. This has been great. Um, this will be one of those podcasts I'll go back and listen to. So there's really good stuff in it. Um, I want to conclude. We we run out of time, and I just want to thank you again, Matthew, so very much for spending this time with me. This is awesome, and I know that our uh, that everybody's going to enjoy it. I want everybody to be aware of Matthew's book that he already has out. That is the Introvert's Edge, and you can get that currently. And then coming out January 2021 is the Introvert's Edge for networking. Did I get the title right? That's it. All right. Awesome. And definitely, Matthew, give us uh, your, in, your um, contact information. If people want to learn more or possibly work with you, how can they reach you? Well, what I would suggest is everyone listening, uh, again, you don't need to hire me to, to, to get this outcome. What I would suggest people do is go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth. And what that will give you is actually a five-step template that you can download and work through yourself. I always suggest teaming up with somebody else to do this. Um, but what it will allow you to do is work through the five-step process will allow you to create your unified message and discover your niche you're willing to buy clients. Now, you know, I did this at the National Freelance Conference and literally 200 people in the room, you know, I said, put up your hand at the end of the session. And if you've now got a message and a niche that you've identified where you can earn great money, where they will see you as the only logical choice. Like 97% of the room put their hands up, which sounds great until I tell you, I said, keep your hands up if this is the most time you spent on marketing since you started your business. And about 85% of the room kept their hands up. So the key is that this template will absolutely work if you spend the time doing it. And you, know, you can download that at matthewpollard.com forward slash growth. Also, if you, if you listen to the first session, then you'll know that I learned a ton of how to sell by watching YouTube videos. So in order to repay that favor as much as I can, you know, I mean, first, I mean, you can Google my name and I, I think I take up the first 20 pages, but you can go to YouTube, you can go to LinkedIn and connect with me there, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you, whatever your medium is, maybe you're even using TikTok, I'm there, I'm there too. Still figuring that one out, but I'm, I'm there. And, um, you know, I share a ton of free videos uh, that will provide you value on how to sell, how to differentiate, and really how to obtain rapid growth in every part of your business. That's awesome. That's, uh, thanks for that gift, gift to the world because we all need it. it yes, absolutely. Well, I want to thank the listeners for listening today. I appreciate you joining us for part two of our interview with Matthew Pollard. Um, this, you know, he is the rapid growth guy for sure. And I want to invite you to subscribe to this podcast as well as give us five, a five-star rating and a few comments. If you'd like to reach me or be in touch with me, please feel free to look me up at uh, look me up at simplythebestresults.com or email me Cheryl, that's C, Cheryl with a C, C-H-E-R-Y-L, Cheryl at simplythebestresults.com. I'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, you guys take care and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star rating and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. To connect with me, Cheryl C. Jones, you can find me on LinkedIn and Facebook by my name. Don't forget that Cheryl is spelled with a C-H and be sure to include my middle initial, the letter C. You're welcome to email me at Cheryl at simplythebestresults.com or visit my website of www.simplythebestresults.com for more information and inspiration. This has been a GSTBR production created and hosted by me, Cheryl C. Jones, edited by Brandy Hockaday and produced by Kathy Holscher. New episodes are available each Thursday on Apple, Stitcher, Spreaker, Google, and many other podcast directories. Thanks for joining us this week, and we'll see you next week. Music